Hey guys, um, I'm going to go over the rest of these slides with you so you can have them in preparation for your exam. Um, this is kind of where we left off in class and uh, we're going to pick it up here. Again, I asked you several times whether or not you thought that um, an endurance athlete that has been trained and that has experienced a doubling in size of mitochondria and quantity of mitochondria if they would have any favorable adaptations that occur because of those um, the mitochondria changes okay so I had asked you guys to kind of consider um, where an endurance athlete would be on this spectrum um, post exercise would they be uh, here where they still have saturated glycogen would they be in a reduced glycogen for, or would they form, or would they be exhausted of glycogen? Okay, so keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, so in class, we kind of went over this. Um, you guys realized that you told me that these represent the contracting muscles, right? So obviously, this is going to be where ATP um, interacts with the myofilaments, and then we're going to have uh, ADP kicked off, right? You guys know that because you drew me pictures to show me how a muscle contracts. You show me that ATP binds to the myosin head. All these wonderful things happen. Uh, the phosphate's kicked off, and then, of course, the ADP is kicked off, and that's what causes the power stroke and the contraction. Um, you identified that when we're in an anaerobic system that we have the ATP PC system that's going to give us uh, energy when we need it. You said that... Uh, when we exhaust that system, we move over here to glycolysis, and you identified that GLUT4 will bring in sugar. Sugar will go either down into glycolysis or it will interact with glucose 6-phosphate. Now, if the energy level of the cell is high, glucose 6-phosphate will convert that sugar into glycogen, right? So there's all these enzymatic steps that happen here you don't need to know but if energy is high so let me draw that so you guys have it if a t p is high this guy is going to convert it to glycogen if a that was a d wow sorry if a d p is high it's not going to convert to glycogen the sugar is going to go through glycolysis to help create more energy all right um you guys also identified that if pyruvate is created and pyruvate goes into the mitochondria for aerobic glycolysis, that it will be converted to acetyl-CoA, enter the Krebs cycle, will develop all these wonderful electron carriers. Those electrons will be delivered to the electron transport chain. And ultimately, after all of that, ADP will can be converted into ATP and this ATP will go up and assist with more muscle contraction, right? So you guys, we just kind of reviewed that. And then if you look over here, if you're wondering what these things are, well, CD36, this is very similar to GLUT4, um, but this is what allows, it's what regulates uh, fatty acids entering the cell, specifically long, long chain fatty acids. So um, that's a transporter that lets fatty acids come into the cell. Um, you know, fatty acids will also bind to a CoA, and from there they'll go beta oxidation. Then they'll be converted into CoA, which will then enter the uh, citric acid cycle, and then so forth and so forth. All right, so you guys are familiar with that. So now I asked you guys to think about these three questions as we go further into the slides. And the first question is how does changes in mitochondria size and volume impact energy production? How does these adaptations alter fuel utilization? And then how do they assist in aerobic muscle contraction? So these are the kind of the three points we're gonna work on over the next few slides here. Um, so if we talk about impact of energy production, we're talking about how does the mitochondria aid in ATP, all right? So if we look at, let's just back up a little bit and look at the physiology of mitochondria and how it interacts with ATP and ADP, okay? So here we can see that we have an untrained, I'm just going to put UT as far as like an untrained mitochondria. It's small. 
and then I have this arbitrary unit of ATP here. So I'm just gonna say that when we exercise an untrained individual, um, let's say we use about 100 units of ATP per minute, all right? It's at a steady, slow pace. Well, when the muscle's contracting and that ATP is binding to the myosin head and getting kicked off as ADP, then we have 100 units per minute of ADP and that is sitting in the cytosol, okay? The ADP that sits in the cytosol then has to enter the mitochondria, where as I showed you on that previous slide, it will be spat back out as ATP. All right, now I want you to pay attention to what I said there because I said this 100 units of ADP is sitting in the cytosol. And if it's sitting in the cytosol, this will act as a signal, okay? ADP in the cytosol signals for other events to happen. Now, if we start exercising, we start to get adaptations, we start to increase our O2 consumption, then what happens is we get this mitochondria that doubles in size. Okay, so I'm gonna say that this is uh, times two, so a double in size. And if we look at that same scenario, we start exercising and we're burning 100 arbitrary units of ATP per minute, then you can see a very different representation right here of how that ADP is sitting in the cytosol. So here you can see that there's 100 units of ADP floating in the cytosol we have a small mitochondria, which means it's going to take a lot of time for this to get into the mitochondria to get converted back into ATP, right? And time is precious when you have things that could possibly signal. Um, when we get a bigger mitochondria, that same ATP content that gets broken down into ADP is now broken down into more digestible, smaller pieces. And what this means is that this mitochondria can remove the ADP from the cytosol of the cell at a much faster rate. So it clears the ADP much quicker, thereby reducing any possible signaling events that ADP can conduct, okay? So the difference between A and B is the bigger the mitochondria, the faster it can suck in ADP and the faster it can convert it to ATP. Okay, so in this, in this example, time and ADP in the cytosol are crucial. The longer it's in there, the longer it can signal. The faster it's out of the cytosol, then the more you limit signaling events. And I just have this guy here because he's representing the bigger buffer mitochondria and he, he kind of looks a little, um, what's the politically correct word I can use? Um, I don't know, it's kind of like a meathead. So that's all I really have to say about that. So I, I, yeah, okay, next slide. Um, so this isn't in your slides, I created this um, for you guys. So I, I asked the question, how does bigger mitochondria impact energy production, okay? So I want you to think that when it comes to mitochondria, bigger is better, right? The bigger mitochondria is a result of alterations from exercise and how it impacts energy production is through this mechanism here. A mitochondria that is doubled in size can also double the transport of cytosolic ADP into the mitochondria for ATP regeneration, all right? So double-double, the, the bigger it is, the faster it can suck in ADP, the faster it can turn it into ATP, and then the more reduction there is in any adverse signaling events because ADP is high in the cell, okay? So if we look at this fission-fusion process again here, we can see that through exercise, through exercise-induced adaptations, we get more mitochondria, Right, that mitochondria enters the mitochondrial network where it will fuse or bind with other healthy existing mitochondria. And here we can see that doubling in size, right? 
The fused mitochondria means bigger mitochondria, more electron transport training capacity, better capacity to turn ADP into ATP, okay? Um, the healthier the cell, the healthier the mitochondria, the more fission we have. Okay, again, this is representing that like old cheese, right? You, get, you cut off the old ends of the moldy dried cheese and then you keep the rest of the cheese, that's good, right? So we have these fission, these small pieces are broken off that are no longer working right and those are sent off to be destroyed through lysosomes, okay? So that's how it impacts energy production. Now, I also asked you guys, how does bigger, better mitochondria alter fuel source, fuel utilization and fuel selection? And here we have our, here we have our buddy here, right? So this, his, his name's probably Dylan. He probably rides a crotch rocket and has like a bad boy club fear me sticker on the back of his Trans Am. So we'll just leave Dylan alone for now. He's, he's dealing with his pecs, obviously. Um, but what happens again is when we have the bigger mitochondria and it can clear this ADP faster from the cell, then it starts to spare other important fuels. So the faster this occurs, the less demand we have on aerobic glycolysis, the less demand we have on ATP PC system, we have less ADP circulation, so there's less signaling events. And if you guys are wondering like, okay, what, what signaling events is he talking about? If ADP is high in the cytosol for a long period of time, it turns these on, right? It turns on ATP PC, it turns on aerobic glycolysis, it turns them on. It will activate glycogen use, all right? So the quicker this is out of the cell, the more it leaves these alone. So now you should be thinking about those pictures that I drew, for, or the pictures of the biopsies and be like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get it now. I'm starting to see where he's going with this, okay? Um, so here they are. So if I told you that the bigger the mitochondria, the more we spear those systems, you should start thinking like, okay, well, now this doesn't make sense because if we have an endurance athlete that has, you know, undergone all these adaptations through training, then now we're looking at either option A or option B. Okay. So would a, an endurance athlete have full saturation of glycogen or would they have just partial use of glycogen? So that's, that's the next question. So um, I told you that high levels of ADP in the cytosol are a messenger, okay? So we want, so here's ADP in the cytosol now. I, I kind of put these guys in here right here. So again, we have muscle contraction, guys, somebody's running, guy or gal's running. ATP is coming in. ATP is helping supply, that's, oh geez, sorry about that. Let me go back. There we go. ATP is supplying muscle contraction. ADP is being spat out. Okay. And, um, oh, it keeps clicking on me. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Let me reorient yeah, orient you one more time. <clears throat> so we talked about, um, several lectures ago, like chapter two and chapter three, how when we have a DP and it is greater than a TP, that's a problem. Oops, geez, this thing's just turning on or off when it wants to. I apologize again. I'm left handed, so my left hand is resting on the tablet and it's like making these things go kind of haywire, but I'm not recording this again. I'm just gonna keep pushing forward. Um, so what I was trying to say, let me, this is probably karma for me making fun of Dylan and his crotch rocket on the previous slide. So I, sorry about that, Dylan. Um, again, when we have ADP, let's try it one more time, greater than ATP, that's a problem. Kind of like Dylan's picture. Um, and we've talked about this before, and we've covered this before, so this slide here should look familiar to you because you've seen this before. Um, the first thing I want you to understand is that there is a self-preservation -preser mechanism in the human body um, which wants to maintain blood glucose and glycogen levels, okay? The body does not like when there's a decrease in glucose, and it doesn't like when there's a decrease in glycogen. 
So as part of this like evolutionary self-preservation mechanism, the body wants to hold on to those specifically for survival. So if you go back 400 years ago, right, our interpretation of exercise 400 years ago is very different to our interpretation to exercise today, right? Today you make time out of your schedule, you go to the gym, um, you know, you go get your fancy workout clothes and your shoes that match the fancy workout clothes and you, you know, you go spend some time and you wail on your pecs like Dylan has. Um, you know, but 400 years ago, 500 years ago, exercise was about how do I not get eaten by something bigger and faster and how do I catch something smaller and slower so I can eat it, right? So um, when we think about that history and we think about our past, we have to understand that our modern interpretation of exercise is very, 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 very different than what DNA has and evolutionary evolution has planned for us. So um, keep that in mind. So we want to preserve glucose. Um, so when we have a moderate level of ADP in the cell, we know that this changes the cell metabolism. Okay. Um, this basically tells us that we are not at a sufficient energy state and this causes us to start to break down right macromolecules to be used and those macromolecules are glycogen right so if adp is floating in the cell for a long period of time and it's not cleared it tells the cell that there's a, a deficit in energy and then the cell says okay we have all this glycogen i'm going to start dumping it so we can start making atp uh, fat is the other thing now when we get higher levels of adp if you look over here we get higher levels of adp than atp well we know that activates a stress protein Right? And that stress protein, when that turns on, that says, okay, we are really low on energy. We got to start metabolizing other things so that we can get energy into the cell and get ATP levels back, back up again. Okay, So this is familiar. You guys have seen this. Here's another one that should be familiar to you. Um, so I just put these in here to kind of represent, okay, we have a high level of ADP in the cell. Okay, I said that the muscle would like to avoid this condition. It doesn't want high levels of ADP. And if there are high levels of ADP, then that says that the cell is under stress. Okay, and again, we the, the devices in our body and evolution, uh, it, it has designed us to not want to be in that state. Okay, so when we have the activation of AMP kinase, right, which you guys know very well because ADP will activate that, then we will have the breakdown of fatty acids and we'll have the breakdown of glycogen and other things that will help get ATP levels back up. So if you look at this one, I, I know you guys remember this because you all didn't like that. We know that um, AMPK will activate glucose metabolism. These are genes, so it will turn on genes. It'll also activate lipid metabolism, okay? Um, it, will try to up, it will try to upregulate glucose uptake. So now if you're thinking as a runner, if ADP is in the cell and ADP is not being cleared and AMP kinase is being activated and AMP kinase recognizes that the cell is under stress, AMP kinase is going to try to induce glycogen use and glucose utilization to help get ATP up, right? But when we have bigger mitochondria and we can clear the ADP, of the cytosol much faster, then we don't activate AMP kinase and we don't activate glycogen use and we don't activate some of these other things that tell the cell that it's under stress, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, this is something you don't have to worry about. I just wanted to show you the mechanism because you guys are getting better at physiology. Um, so this is just basically showing you the mechanisms that AMPK activates. So if we have let me just draw it out here and you can follow my pen if we have high levels of ADP and we have small mitochondria and that mitochondria is not clearing the cytosol of ADP quick enough then AMPK turns on okay AMPK will activate CD36 and as I said earlier uh, on the first side CD36 is very similar to GLUT4 uh, but it lets uh, this stands for long chain fatty acids. It will let long chain fatty acids enter into the cell. Long chain fatty acids will connect with the CoA. They will enter the mitochondria, go through beta oxidation, go through the citric acid cycle, go through the electron transport chain, and ADP will be converted into ATP. 
okay? Another thing that it does is it activates uh, IMTG, which stands for intramuscular triglycerides. So any fat that's being stored in the muscle, that will become active and that will go through the same sort of processes and ATP will be created. So again, just because ADP is high in the cytosol, it will activate all of these events, okay? So I keep trying to make that message very clear is if ADP is removed because the mitochondria is bigger, then it will alter fuel source utilization and it will also increase energy production. Okay, uh, here's just another one kind of killing, you know, beating a dead horse right now. If we have ADP high in the cell, we know that ADP will activate glucose 6-phosphate in a way that will stop storing glycogen, okay? So this guy will increase his activity to send glucose down to pyruvate, and at the same time, glycogen will enter glycolysis and go down into pyruvate. Now the same thing, now the inverse would be true if we had a high level of ATP. If we had a high level of ATP, glucose 6-phosphate would then store glycogen and he wouldn't be telling um, the other enzymes to start secreting it, okay? So now this picture should be coming very clear to you, all right? So this kind of sums it all up. So when we have a mitochondria that is double in size, okay, it can reduce the chemical messenger quickly. Again, the ADP is the chemical messenger. So we're running, ATP is going into the contractile properties, proteins, that's spitting out ADP, we have this big mitochondria now, right? So I'm gonna say times two, so it's much bigger. So now what happens is because the mitochondria is bigger and it can manage more ADP at a much faster rate, the ADP will go into the mitochondria much faster, be converted to ATP much faster, and ATP will then go up to, that fell short, sorry about that, should go up here, sorry about that. ATP will then go up into the contracting muscles and keep it, uh, allow it to keep exercising. So all of that happens because this guy just got bigger. All right, so these, this, these are cellular mechanisms that are really important and this is, this is what I wanted to show you is that when we're talking about sparing other fuels, right? So if, we, if, this, if these events happen, then this guy, this ATP, being activated, or sorry, being upregulated, and ADP getting into the mitochondria much faster inhibits glycogen from being used. Used. Okay? So this really comes down to time and ADP. So if ADP is in the cytosol for a longer period of time, we have greater use of other fuels. If ADP is in the cytosol for a lower time, we have lower use of those fuels, right? We don't use them. As you can see here, this means that it's inhibited, okay? So those adaptations occur and basically um, it all depends on how long those um, reduced ADP are floating in the cell. So now you should be looking at this and saying, okay, I totally get it. Um, it's not going to be here. I asked you guys whether you think it's A or B. And now that you know that an endurance athlete through exercise and through exercise adaptations develops more mitochondria, those mitochondria go through more mitochondria fusion and fission. We have more electron transport chains in those mitochondria. When the muscle's contracting, it produces a lot of ADP, but because the mitochondria is so big, it can bring that ADP at a much faster rate and convert it to ATP at a much faster rate, thereby it eliminates ADP in the cytosol as a signaling molecule, and as a result, it spares the use of glycogen. And we don't rely on glycogen, so runners are very different than a lot of, than most of us. Most of us, when we exercise, we burn through so much glycogen trying to get to the aerobic system that there's nothing left. But in a runner, 
they preferentially use fat and oxygen and they get to that system much faster than the rest of us and because they do that they just have reduced mito i'm sorry reduced glycogen at the end of their performance or exercise session so uh, if you pick that one you were absolutely right and the mechanism of that is increased mitochondria size increased volume and decreased time that adp is spent in the cytosol this next slide is for you guys to read. You have it on your records. I'm not going to read this for you. It's totally up to you. Um, look at it, and uh, I am going to go back and present one more small little baby lecture for you guys, and then I'm done. So I hope this helps. Study. Remember the pictures. Remember the images. Remember the figures. And I'll be back momentarily with the next lecture.